Hey guys, and welcome to or back to the Pause in Pursuit podcast with your host, Summer Clark. Now, you might be like, Summer, why am I suddenly so close to your face? I've decided to once again switch things up and I brought the camera closer to me, thought it'd make the audio quality better. You can see right up my nostrils, all the good things. Anyway, so I hope you're not completely intimidated by the closeness that we are in right now. However, today we have a very exciting episode. Um, I asked you guys on Instagram stories the other day to ask me a load of questions for a blind Q&A. So I haven't looked at these questions yet. I screenshotted them on my phone on Instagram, sent them to my computer without reading them. And I now have them up on the screen, but I promise you I haven't read them yet. Um, I'm a little bit scared. I hope you haven't been too brutal. Um, but yeah, we're going to dive into the questions. Like I said, unseen questions, unprepared answers. Haven't even seen them yet, so it's going to be my live answers. No time to think, just completely honest, raw, live answers to your questions. I have, I can't remember, I did count them. There's like nearly 20 questions, something like that. But yeah, let's just dive straight into this blind Q&A. So, right, I'm going to actually read them now. So... Here we go. The first question is, have you ever experienced the feeling of losing your agility mojo before and how did you deal with this? Okay, so um, as most of you probably saw after my um, last competition, which was Iconics, great show at the weekend. Um, I kind of just had the sense of sort of, I felt a bit, a bit defeated, deflated. I'd say for the past month or so, I kind of just felt like I've lost my agility mojo. I haven't felt as connected with Arrow. I haven't enjoyed it as much when I'm running. Training's been fine. It's just competing. Um, and I think most of that is, you know, it's since losing Earl, to be fair. Um, I feel so. If you've watched my last few podcast episodes, I did tell you that I feel like I've dealt with losing Earl really well um, and stayed strong and all that. However, um, my agility performance just hasn't been there since losing him. Um, you know, I just feel more emotional, um, just less confident, just unhappier. And obviously, you know, happy handle a happy dog. Um, you can't connect with your dog if you're not in a good headspace. And I think that's what's happened to me over the past month with Arrow Blessing. It's probably wondering what's wrong with me. Um, but yeah, so I felt like I've lost my mojo a bit in that sense. Um, I also have felt like my confidence has been knocked a little bit because... Um, Obviously, I just did jumping classes with Arrow for such a long time to try and build his confidence as he was so nervous. So we were in the lower grades for absolutely months, like longer than you normally would be, because obviously we weren't doing agility classes to get those wins to progress up the grades. So I basically got used to doing loads of easy courses with Arrow and winning all of them, but just keeping doing them because we weren't getting agility wins because we weren't doing agility classes. Then... Once we finally started doing agility classes, we just bosh, 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 bish, bash, bosh, won them pretty much quickly. And now we're only one great, one great, one winner, agility winner away from grade seven. And I just feel like it's all happened really quickly. Like a lot of you um, have said before that, you know, he's done so well as, you know, he's gone straight up the grades as soon as he started doing agility and stuff, which I agree. He is amazing. However, now um, we're in six, seven classes. Um, it seems to have happened all of a sudden and the courses are so brutal um, as they should be. However, I feel like I haven't taught half the skills to Arrow yet because all I've done um, pretty much since the very beginning of his agility career is work on his confidence and drive and speed just to get him to run, you know, at his best, which I have achieved. However, instead of teaching those little bitty skills that you need in the high grades, haven't wanted to do too much of that because I don't want to knock his confidence. So, you know, all I've been focusing on is getting it, even though the dog walk, yes, it's a skill, but I've, I haven't taught him turns or anything. I just want him to power along because just to get that that speed and drive and, and confidence out of him. So that's all I've really worked on. Um, so then we go into the ring and there's all these skills that I think, oh, we haven't even taught this and it requires a lot of thinking. Um, and obviously we don't get it right when we haven't trained the skill, can't expect to. But at the same time, it has just knocked my confidence, unfortunately, a little bit. Um, I don't think it's knocked his confidence, just mine. Uh, but obviously he's going to feed off of that. So we just need to work on those skills. Uh, we're going to go dig deeper, work harder than ever before, and we will get there. Um, again, Arrow's journey has never been and probably isn't meant to ever be a, you know, straight simple easy journey 
but um that has happened lately so i have felt like my agility mojo has just slipped a little bit um it's been really hard to be fair it's just like you don't want to lose the enjoyment of what you're meant to be passionate about and that is honestly how i felt lately so if anyone else is going through that just remember it's i'm sure you know everyone does it at some point i have heard about other people doing it and that's why i did put that poster out there and to answer this question properly, that was a little bit of a background um, if you haven't seen my Instagram. But yes, I've had it before. Probably not as much as this time. But last time, I had it a bit with Earl, uh, bless him, to start off with because he was so unmotivated. Um, and it was taking forever to get him up the grades, you know. And that's why I was so excited when he got that last winter grade six. But he was only like 0.1 second in the course time. But me and my mum screamed, I remember um emma pullen at the time at the dog vegas show um i'd never talked to her before i was really young and she looked at me and my mum like what is going on because we were just jumping up and down at this result book this is when the results were in the books on paper wow ancient times um so but i was young it was my hobby so i didn't really lose my mojo but it was a tough time so i don't really class that as losing my mojo but I do feel like I lost my mojo um, more near the end of Ethel's agility career because I knew I'd got the most out of her. And this is something I'm super passionate about is getting the most out of every dog you have. Um, you know, I personally, um, I want to get the most out of the dog that I'm working with until I sort of think about bringing another dog out or training up another dog. I want to do all the work with the dog I have in the moment until I know that I've got the everything out of them that I possibly can, which I did with Earl, um, retired him after I got him to grade six because it was a huge plateau. Um, and that was more potluck than anything, bless him. Um, and he wasn't enjoying it anymore. And then with Ethel, um, obviously she was my team GB dog. We achieved all these awesome stuff, but then we plateaued because like I said, agility's only getting faster. She wasn't the fastest. She was getting clears consistent, but never really in the places often getting time faults. And that was hard because she was my only agility dog and it just felt like a, a fat plateau, basically. Uh, like, we weren't getting anywhere. Um, we weren't progressing. There's nowhere to progress. She was in grade seven. She'd been on TGB three years. She wasn't ever going to win champ, really, um, uh, with her speed against the dogs that are there. Um, you know, there's usually not just one clear in a champ final. That never happened for us. Um, so it was frustrating and I just felt demotivated at the time because I was like, well, now what? There's nowhere to go. And then she started jumping all her contacts and bailing this off the side of the seesaw. Now, I was talking to someone about this. I was talking to um, Millie about this the other day at Iconics. And it was when Ethel, when Ethel started doing this with her contacts. And I took her to a physio and she had some tightness in her quads and stuff like that. Um... But, you know, nothing overly serious. Um, but then, you know, it, it kind of got worse. And um, it was Karen Laker at the time as part of Team GB. She said, you know, consider maybe it's physical. And she's ba she's jumping the contact on the A-frame of the dog walk because the gradient is steep. And if she, she's, she was taught a two-on-two-off, again, would never now teach a dog a two-on-two-off, especially on an A-frame, bloody hell especially not a tiny dog like Ethel as well. She was pretty much doing a handstand and like off the seesaw or two on two off. And, you know, the, when it hit the floor, it'd raise up because uh, she was so little and light and she'd be doing like a handstand. But obviously I did the best I could at the time. I didn't know, but now I wouldn't do that anymore. Um, for a little dog, I'd do a four on for the seesaw um, and obviously run in for A-frame dog walk. However, um, obviously I always got a two on two off on the seesaw because he's a bigger dog, heavier dog, besides the point, you know what I mean? Um, so Karen thought, you know, it might be hurting her joints in her shoulders or her back when she has to decelerate on that steep gradient and stop. Hence why she's avoiding the pain. And I trained so hard to, tr to get train it out of her. Um, and when she knew she was getting cheese, she was fine. You know, border terriers, greedy, they'll do anything for food. But in competition, she knew I'd never get the cheese, so it's not worth the pain. So I'm thinking that's what happened. Um, and the seesaw, she knew what she was doing. Because obviously she was like seven, eight and she lit, well, yeah, eight when I retired her. And she, you know, she knew the, the skill. She knew what she had to do on the seesaw. She was running all the way to the end, stopping as it went down. And as it nearly touched the floor, she would just fall off le left or right, like just hop off to the side. So she wasn't flying it. You know, she knew what she, she was doing. And we think that that is because she was avoiding the impact of it banging on her joints. So that happened again, not that's that's fair enough i understand but at the time it was really frustrating 
you know, I'd already felt like we were plateauing and then she wasn't getting in contact, so we weren't even going clear anymore. So I was like, oh my God, now what do I do? You know, because she was my only agility dog. Um, Obviously I brought Arrow out then and it was, and then that helped, you know, I mean, something else to focus on and, and a way to progress again, but obviously his journey was hard too. Um, but then, yeah, I did retire Ethel, um, last summer, but yeah, so I have that, those were, that was when I felt like I lost my agility mojo with Ethel when we plateaued and then she started missing her contacts and there was nothing I could do about it. So it has happened before twice, really that then with Ethel and now with Arrow, um, yeah, I wouldn't really say it happened with Earl too much because I was a child and I wasn't too fussed. Um, but yeah, so it has happened before. And then how did I deal with this? So with Ethel, um, I, I think the best way to deal with anything is to keep going. Because if you do everything you can and you know you're doing and I've done everything you possibly can to rectify the situation and it's still not working, at least you can say, yeah, but I've done everything I can. And it's out of your control. And try to adopt the mindset that if it's out of your control... Don't stress about it. You tried. Okay. Um, so that really helped. And obviously this time with Arrow, talk, talk to people about it. Be like, look, this is happening. I feel like I'm losing my agility mojo. You know, you get the, you get people being super supportive and nice and complimenting. And it's like, and you know, it's not seeking that reassurance and needing compliments to feel better about yourself again. It's thinking, you know, other people give you their perspectives like, but you're still doing amazing. Your runs are still amazing. You know, look how far you come with Arrow. Just take a step back and think logically and get reminded by people that you are actually still doing amazing and it will get better. Uh, talk to people who've had a similar situation before because everyone's been through stuff like this. Um, the, the journey's like this. <laughs> and if you're not watching on YouTube, my hand's going up and down like a crazy thing. Um, but no journey is li linear. And I'm just trying to think now that it will pass. You know, with Earl, there's nothing I can do about that. It will get easier. I'm just going to keep training Arrow, training the skills um, and doing as much as we can. Obviously, we can't do it every day because we don't have um, a ton of equipment or space to do a course, uh, course running. But as long as I feel like I'm doing as much as I can to help the situation, then that is how I deal with it. Um, not quitting. Don't quit <laughs> unless it's causing unless you hate it. Don't quit. Uh, you know, I have days where I'm like, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too emotionally draining. Iconics was one of those days thinking that was a terrible day. I just felt awful. I just, my confidence was gone. I wasn't enjoying myself. Um, I felt like I didn't belong in the high grades. Um, imposter syndrome came through. You know, I was like, what am I doing here? Me and Arrow shouldn't be in these classes, you know, with the grade seven medium dogs that I've looked up to since I started with Ethel. And it just felt really bizarre. I was like, why are we here? That's just strange. Like, there's no way. Why am I even trying to compete against these people? But then you've got to snap out of it and remember you know, use it as training, you will get there eventually. When Arrow is experienced, um, as experienced as those dogs, he will be just as amazing with hard work. So that is how I dealt with it mostly. But yeah, if you're going through the same thing, look at me into the soul, don't give up, just keep trying. Know that I'm going through exactly the same thing. We'll get through it together, it's okay, it's fine. And that mojo will come back, nothing lasts forever, everything passes, it's all part of the journey. You'll look back on it and be like, you know, that made me stronger. Um, and if you can keep going through these really hard periods, it means you're even stronger. Um, you know, the the test, the real test of character is not what you do when everything's going well. It's what you do when everything's going shite, basically. So that is how I deal with it. Um, obviously, I do like my psychology uh, mental book books. So I've been reading a lot of those as well. And, you know, sort of sports person mindset books and stuff like that. So just dig deeper um keep your chin up if possible don't give up express it talk about it and you will be fine you'll get through it that was such a long answer to question one i've probably already been speaking for like hours uh just on question one but anyway that was my answer um i'm quite passionate about that at the moment because that is exactly what i'm going through i have a lot to say but yeah if you need any support or more information about that then please do dm me they're always open and we can chat so number two what equipment is worth getting for extra agility training at home? Okay, so I don't have tons of equipment and I don't have a ton of space to use it in, in the garden. You know, it's not bad. I can fit like two jumps space nicely, really. Um, and not, pff, well, just legal. So just like five meters. <laughs> um, but so I've got three jumps. I've got a dog walk, but obviously I cannot fit it back and use the bottom plank. Um, so it is definitely, you definitely need probably at least three jumps if you've got the room. Um, you, I wouldn't say go out and get a full dog walk, so expensive, but, um, 
if you could get like a second hand down plank even even if it's a wooden one just to have on the floor or just propped up to start to you know just practice your mat work and stuff like that that is important i've got a seesaw that's been a lifeline for arrow uh, i've been doing a seesaw every day for ages not anymore but i used to um i should probably start doing that again um because he's going through it a bit with his seesaw again now but a seesaw is i think super important because it is often the equipment that can worry dogs a lot um so yeah three jumps a plank of some sort so a down plank really um i'd say a seesaw again i know it's expensive and i am grateful that i've had the means to buy these things um but you probably and a tunnel you probably want a tunnel i don't use my tunnel too much i've got a first contact one but it is there and it is helpful for like practicing wrong ends and stuff like that tunnel skills you know um dig dig so arrows uh go into the tunnel and turn tight so all the skills around pieces of equipment um so if you've got a tunnel doesn't have to be massive like even five four meters five meters um what else do i have i'm looking into the garden now like the equipment's there and it's not but i'm picturing it there because i can't remember what i've got what else do i have weaves absolutely weaves channel weaves if you're using the channel method get bloody channel weaves you're going to need weaves weaves are hard and you need to be able to practice the entries the exits all the things so in summary i'd say at least one or two jumps okay you don't need three i don't really use three in one go one or two one you can practice a lot on a single jump don't underestimate it so you want one jump um two if you want to start sequencing them a little bit but one definitely so you want a jump uh probably a little tunnel you want weaves um so channel weaves ideally if that's what you're using to train your dog weaves or just a normal set of weaves if your dog's already trained um then you want a plank of some sort so a down plank for a dog walk really and a seesaw those are really what would be my staple pieces of equipment i'd say that i would have struggled without um, and have really be benefited me for training at home with little space and i think that is it i'm pretty sure that is all the equipment i have so that is what i'd recommend to get for training at home so number three is a cute one who is your agility hero lucy norton obviously so my trainer and sponsor lucy norton um always looked up to lucy um ever since i started with earl um she is exactly what i've always aspired to be like um you know she's got her own training business her she you know she she's done so well with all her dogs she's won olympia crufts been on team gb all of these things um and yeah lucy is absolutely my agility hero i've always looked up to her and she inspires me and i admire her i want to be exactly like her as i go through my agility career it sounds soppy but yeah if i had to choose one agility hero it would absolutely be lucy norton um, but obviously there's so many amazing people in agility but yeah lucy has always been that hero character for me in agility and not just in agility in life in general like she is super motivated you know she's driven she's a businesswoman as well like i said with her business um and not just her agility business but you know she's just got a she's getting a new field uh, she's gonna start like expanding out into different branches of training and just to get you know more business more opportunities for our clients and people with dogs and that are into dog training you know for for pet dogs as well not just competing dogs in agility and yeah you know she'll with her sponsors she'll buy she'll get toys you know sell them she stocks products and sells them so she's a great businesswoman as well as agility competitor and trainer so yeah 100 percent for that question number four what is your advice to those attending their first show what do you bring and where do you find the results okay so first of all easy questions i'll say where do you find the results it depends on what show it is most of the time um it's agility plaza um first place processing is kind of dropping off at the moment i think uh but mobile.firstplaceprocessing.com i think it is um if it's first place pro if you entered on first place processing it'll be mobile.firstplaceprocessing.com if you entered on agility plaza just go into your agility plaza account and then it's live and imminent shows and then results or ring plan and you can get everything there and that's really it i don't think i can't remember the last time i used anything that wasn't those two for results uh so they're all online what do you bring so what you take to training basically um oh there's so much to bring but the essentials i'm gonna say clothing that's suitable to the weather for you so whether that's a uh, shorts a vest if it's hot um or obviously like a coat hoodie joggers stuff like that if it's cold you want your good agility shoes you want to be in something you can run comfortably in 
and then also obviously you want to bring yourself food um and stuff like that to keep you energized so like a snack lunch another snack probably you know dinner if you're going to be there all day who knows you only you know how hungry you get i get very hungry so i always pack lots of food uh feel like i'm talking really quickly i'm sorry um got quite a bit of energy today weirdly um and what else do you bring so that's really for you and obviously you might want stuff to do so obviously phone a book if you want to do yeah i take my laptop and do a bit of work so things to do in between runs for yourself so whatever floats your boat um and then for your dog obviously you want collar lead harness the things you normally use when you go out with your dog you want to take lots of water for both you and your dog a bowl obviously your dog's reward so make sure you take your dog's favorite agility reward whether that's a toy or treats um or both you know if you want to do some training around the ring uh, with treats and then use your ball when you run stuff like that and i think that's pretty much the basics and then obviously your dog's probably want to take a coat for your dog if it's cold um a fleece or a raincoat probably want to take raincoat for your dog anyway even if it's not raining when you leave because it might be and same for yourself and i think that's pretty much everything i might have missed some things but that's pretty much what i bring you know i do bring more but they're the essentials you can bring whatever you want really um and also it depends how far away it is uh, if it's really local you might need less than if it's like three hours away and so your advice to those attending their first show see i knew doing live answers that i hadn't prepared there'd be a bit of poor there'd be a bit of pause there'd be some pauses in this episode as i try and think about my answer what was your advice to those attending their first show really hard this is a really hard one to answer but try to relax and i've said this before try and enjoy it and use it as experience and training so if you go in really stressed out and putting loads of pressure on yourself it's probably going to go more wrong so just pretend you're back at training um relax um don't panic about it you know um ideally take a groom if it's your first show um i still take a groom <laughs> my mum always comes with me i find it so much nicer having company and also helpful um bless her when she helps sort me out and stuff um me and our out before and after runs and holding stuff and clothing and everything and you know i often rock up in my big baggy hoodie and joggers you probably see me around at shows and then i strip off right next to the ring and she's there with all these this clothing over her arms and stuff as i run um, and someone to film your runs as well so that you can you know even if you're there on your own get someone to film your runs then you can analyze your performance what went wrong what went well and then you can go away and train after um and that really helps with the mindset of you know think of it as training think of it as getting things to work on training in a new environment stuff like that so yeah just don't panic basically keep calm um it's really not that scary i know it feels like it uh the more you do the easier it's gonna get so yeah just enjoy it it's so much fun there's so much more to a show than just the you know running and the winning you know there's stalls there's all sorts to do so think of it as like a nice little day out basically so number five is what is your favorite cheese um okay this is a great question i'm gonna say red leicester yeah red leicester mature nice and mature nice and like like proper smelly cheese like really flavorsome mature red leicester cheese that is my favorite cheese however oh no however i do love mozzarella as well depends what i'm having it with mozzarella dippers like from mackie's or something banging but oh camembert as well oh no okay see i have mature red leicester like it say in a cheese sandwich or something or like on beans and eggs on toast i'll have a bit of mature red leicester or if i'm just like i will cut a block of that cheese and just eat it but now i'm thinking about it mozzarella in dippers 100 percent. and then the mackies i keep saying mackies because i work there part-time but camembert bites at christmas from mcdonald's absolutely insane and obviously camembert ring camembert ring where you get the bread and you dip it in the camembert that's so hard i'm gonna have to say camembert i think yeah yeah i think i'm gonna oh no brie there's brie brie and cranberry panini oh my god there was a i don't know if any of you have seen at some shows there's a food van and it's called potato crazy and they do becca will know what i'm on about becca c and it is what is it it's a brie bacon and cranberry panini and it's banging but yeah so brie as well but i just love cheese in general i'm a huge cheesy that's not a thing but i just said it anyway um so i'm gonna have to put my foot down and say i'm gonna go with camembert i'm gonna go with camembert so 
That was a great question. I'm really thrown off now. I'm thinking about cheese. I'm hungry. Number six, what has been your least favourite part of Training Arrow? Oh boy, okay. My least favourite part of Training Arrow. The worry when he seemed to hate it and the guilt. That's my least favourite part. My least favourite part is, you know, it is a rewarding thing is teaching a dog with no motivation to do agility and then seeing it get motivated. But at the same time, it's such a worrying process at the same time. I just said that twice. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, probably um, the least my least favourite part of Training Arrow is the days where, you know, he wasn't feeling it and he wasn't enjoying himself. He seemed nervous and I felt guilty for making him do it. I felt guilty for making him work through it. But at the end of the day, you, getting him to work through it and working through his nerves was the way to get him now to where he is today. So it had to be done. But that wasn't a nice feeling at the time. My, yeah, so my least favourite part of Training Arrow has been his lack of confidence and working through that. Training that out of him has been gruelling, to be fair. Uh, worth it, now I've got there, and it's so rewarding once it's happened. Um, and when you see it happening, when you see that gradual increase, but on the days where they're, he's just flat and not enjoying it, that's horrible. Not nice. So number seven is, what is your least favourite part of agility? Oh, interesting question my least favorite part of agility is oh dear that's really hard look i'm gonna just be sat here like i don't know because i haven't prepared any of my answers see this is the fun of it you all get to listen to me go um e, i don't know let me think about it so obviously i'll probably tie this into the last question so the nervy you know do, my least favorite part of agility is when you get the dogs that are unmotivated and you have to work them that's not fun that's my least favorite part of agility agility is fun when the dog's loving it because when the dog loves it you love it um so yeah my least favorite part of agility is when the dog's not having a great time um also my least favorite part of agility is when you're having an off day and you can't connect with the dog like my lack of agility mojo at the moment or feeling like i've lost it those days where you don't feel in sync with your dog it's so frustrating it's not nice even if the dog's not nervous yeah that's probably my least favorite part of agility the days where the connection is just not there and you don't know how to get it and you just can't get it you're just having a bad day you're just having an off day which is fair enough but it's not nice <laughs> so yeah my least favorite part of agility is when for whatever reason you and your dog just aren't feeling connected that's so frustrating there's nothing better than the feeling of being connected with your dog when you're doing agility but when that's not there, agility is poor. Like, it's not fun, <laughs> basically. So that's got to be my least favourite part. Um, however, I've got to also say um, my least favourite part is another least favourite part. Um, probably second to that is, well, I don't know, actually, because really this is the most important part of agility, that when you see it go wrong is my least favourite part, and that is dogs taking, like, tumbles or falling off dog walks or stuff. That's probably my least favourite part, actually. Yeah, least favourite part of agility is the danger of injury for the dog and you, to be fair. But yeah, the safety aspect when, you know, yeah, that's going to be it. My least favourite part is has got to be when you don't have a safe course or a safe line or you see a dog tumble or something. That's my least favourite part because it is a sport at the end of the day. And then obviously my second least favourite part is that lack of connection. But yeah, safety first when a course isn't safe or when a dog... Um, for whatever reason, no one's fault, but takes a tumble or hurts itself. That's my least favourite part. And the worry of that happening, least favourite part. Worry of dog injury, least favourite part. No, thank you. And I always feel guilty. Uh, I Well, touch wood. I'm looking for wood. Touch wood. Touching wood. Right, there we go. Um, I haven't been in that situation, really. But Arrow has hurt himself, but not doing agility again. I keep touching. I'm scared. It's like my worst nightmare. It's my worst nightmare. My mum's really superstitious and has drummed the touch wood into me over the years. I'm sorry being a weirdo but yeah um i would feel so guilty i'd be like i'm so sorry this is my fault i made you do this i asked you to do agility and you hurt yourself so i'd feel like it was me to blame it's not a nice way to think about it but that is probably what i'd think so yeah least favorite part big time okay eight when and why did you start agility oh i love answering this question so when and why when where well i got ill when i was eight and when i was about nine i think no 10 i started agility no nine no 10 yeah 10 because he was two yeah i was 10 when i started agility in 20 so i was born in 2010 20, 2012 i think it was yeah 2012 i started agility um why well again a lot of you probably heard this story but 
Um, I took Earl to a training club, my local training club, just for pets, you know, obedience, life skills, stuff like that. Did that for like a year or so. And then the trainer was like, oh, you should try agility. Um, so I was like, why not? Why the hell not? So I'm going to yawn. Oh, dear. Okay, I'm not bored, I promise. Um, <coughs> that was all going wrong. Um, and I'd read a book, a child, a children's book, obviously. Don't judge me. I was like eight, nine. Um, and the girl in it got a dog and trained at agility. And obviously, I, I also had Nintendogs. A lot of you will appreciate this. Nintendogs on the DS. I had a little pink DS. Get my dogs. I'd train them up in agility. And I'd take them to competitions. And I'd win every single time. I'd win like three competitions a day, I think was the max. And I'd win all of them. And I'd be like, this is so good. I'm so talented. Blah, blah, blah. On the Nintendo DS. Great times. So I already knew it was a thing. So I was like, oh, yeah, let's try that in real life. So I went along. Did it with Earl in this class. And it was amazing. I'm going to yawn again. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening to me. I just said I have loads of energy. But, um, so I tried it, loved it, and that the rest is complete history. Um, I just found out that it was a thing, tried it, loved it, carried on doing it. That's that's my why, really. And yeah, um, so number nine is, how should I deal with a dog that bites out of frustration in the ring? Oh no, okay. What kind of bite? I would like to know if it was like a full-on bite or just like nipping the ankles. I know some dogs nip at the ankles or jump up and try and nip the person's fingers but if it's like a full-on bite then that's a problem and i probably not, wouldn't do agility with that dog until it is figured it until we'd figured that out um i think yeah the frustration aspect that can be helped with exercises um for example forward drive exercises so a lot of the time you've probably heard of a velcro dog so people call velcro uh, people call dogs that won't go forward and work independently and have no forward focus or drive velcro dogs as in they velcro to your side and they don't go anywhere else they stick right next to you and that is frustrating so there are a lot of exercises you can do to help this i don't love to give loads of training advice out for free because at the end of the day I do have an online dog training business to run. However, yes, forward focus and drive exercises will really help this if your dog learns how to work independently and listen to cues and work away from you and look forward and drive forward, then the frustration won't be there, okay? So it takes a while to practice, but that is that I would say those are your next steps. Like I said, I'm not trying to plug my business in that i'm not trying to get you to pay me but i do offer this for my online training if you do want really specific guidance and like me to tell you exactly what exercise and stuff but i can't do that now because one i have a business two it would take forever but yeah i do offer that in my online dog training services um so i'll put the link here on the screen if you want to go check those out on my website and message me for a price list stuff like that but that is definitely something i could help you with but yeah forward focus independence exercises training stuff like that so that is definitely what you need to do so where is the next question number 10 what was your favorite module within your degree course okay this is interesting um so as a lot of you probably know i did um canine behavior and training degree i did a i did that at uni did that at bishop burton uni the foundation degree it was three years, part-time, distance learning. Um, so I did it from home. Obviously, when Arrow was little, I started that. Um, oh, my God, it's happening again. <sighs> and, yes, yeah, so my favourite module. I was going to say canine psychology, but I also love the... Um, oh, my God, I love so much of it. So the, my favourite parts were psychology, um, anatomy and physiology as, and nutrition. Those are my three favourites. If I had to pick one, well, it was a dog training degree, so I'm going to say psychology. So dog psychology was probably the most, my favourite one, because it was the most to do with what I wanted to study, which is dog training. So yeah, canine okay, psychology. However, uh, being into fitness and nutrition myself, I also love the nutrition and the anatomy and physiology modules, because um, I could relate a lot of those to me. And obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm big into fitness and nutrition for myself. So those were super interesting as well. But for the course, the, the best module really, if you're doing a canine behaviour training degree, is canine psychology. But yeah, um, nutrition and anatomy and physiology is great too, because you learn about, you know, what um, to feed your dog and how food, how your dog's diet affects its behaviour. Um, 
and then and performance and stuff like that and then also anatomy and physiology i really enjoyed because i related that to agility so like the dog's uh, skeletal muscle uh, skeleton muscles joints tendons ligaments all of that how the dog is structured which I really related to agility. So that was also cool. It's really hard to pick a favourite. Um, but yeah, the psychology was all about how the dog's brain works, how it learns and stuff like that. So for a canine behaviour and training degree, that was probably the best module. Um, and then number 11 is, what are your favourite breeds apart from a working cock spaniel? Working cock spaniel, no, I'm joking. <laughs> but yes, to be fair, my favourite breed is a working cock spaniel. Um, I think I will always have them now after Arrow. He, I love him to bits, he's perfect. However... Obviously, I'm always going to have a soft spot for Border Terrier. So Border Terrier is always going to be in my list of favourite breeds. Um, however, I wouldn't get another one for agility, but they are a brilliant pet. And if I was just going to have a pet, I would have a Border Terrier. Um, obviously, I, could, I wouldn't get a working breed like Arrow and not do agility with it as a pet. That's not okay. So Border Terrier um, is always going to be one of my favourites because heart dog, you know, heart and soul dog, first dog. Special connection with Borders. Um, but oh, other breeds... I, will, I do want to own a Border Collie one day. Um, I love watching Border Collies. So I'm probably going to say Border Collie is another favourite breed of mine. Um, but I, I've only ever experienced owning and um, handling and, you know, working with and living with a Border Terrier and a Working Dog Spaniel, which I already mentioned. But from looking at other dogs, Border Collie, Mali, I know they're so hard work. I probably wouldn't own one, but I love the look of them and I love the drive and work ethic of them. But I wouldn't own one and I don't know if I ever would or I'm not in a place to own one now, no way. And I can't, you know, I probably wouldn't own one um, unless my life circumstances changed. But you never know, maybe one day. But at the moment I wouldn't own one, but I do love the look of them and their character. Although I know they're super hard work. <laughs> so yeah, Collie and Amali, love them. Um, so yeah, they're probably my two other favourite breeds that I've got my eye on that I really enjoy. However, I think that might be it. Um, I like mini Americans as well. They're really cool. And poodle crosses. So you've got your doodles and stuff like collie poodle. Collie poodle. So yeah, collie poodle, mini American, border collie, Mali. There's four of my other favourite breeds from just from looking at them. Um, obviously, I've had no experience with them, but I do love those four. So, what is your favourite thing about Arrow? This is such a cute question. Oh, there's so many things. I love everything about Arrow. Just Arrow being Arrow. Um, My favourite thing about Arrow, probably going to say is, oh my god, this is so hard. I'm never doing another blind Q&A again. No, I'm joking. Here's... I don't know. <laughs> How do I choose something? I know what I want to say, but I don't know how to put it into words and describe it as one thing. His, his okay, his, my favourite thing about Arrow is his love for me and want to please me and just obsession with me. That sounds really self-centred and it sounds like I'd be someone in a relationship that was like, obsess over me. But I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not like that at all. However, with Arrow, I just love how much he loves me and I love the connection we have. Um, I Obviously, I have a different and just a strong connection with the borders but for some reason it's just different with arrow like um i'll get up and he'll follow me wherever i go um he always runs up and greets me with a kong in his mouth and he's just like wagging his whole body and his bum's going and everything and his tail's like propelling but his attitude yeah so oh that's really hard yeah his connection with me how much he loves me and the fact that you can just see it that i'm the center of his universe and that is so cute and it makes feel like i have an insane incredible relationship with him um which i do and then also his attitude to like like he's just so happy he loves things like he just loves life like everything excites him um you know bezzing around the field on a walk he's just such, so full of life and so positive like if he was a person he'd be a really positive upbeat person like maybe a shy person in a way but a really kind upbeat kind-hearted little soul like there's so many things i love about him but yeah his connection with me and his, his lovely, just loving, happy, positive attitude. So, yeah. Um, I don't know if I could choose just one. Probably connection, because like I said, connection is super important. And there's no, no better feeling than having a super strong connection with the dog. And I definitely have that about with Arrow. So, my connection with Arrow and the way he looks at me is probably... You know, the way he looks at and interacts with me is probably my favourite thing about him. But then a close second is just his positive attitude to life. So, 
that was so cute i'm gonna go hug him so hard after this um i'd probably do that anyway but still so 13 what do you oh this is a good one what do you eat throughout the day to perform well at a competition so i'm actually gonna do um i have a, an idea which I haven't announced on Instagram yet, but my idea is to do what's called a fitness and food Friday. So I'm going to start this Friday, I think. I'm going to announce it on Instagram on Friday. So you're getting a two day warning um, and I'm going to do fitness and food Friday. So every Friday I'm going to do a post about something to do with food or fitness. Because yes, I've, my, my account is an agility account, dog account, etc. But I'm also really passionate about handle fitness and nutrition and just handle, and, and just fitness and nutrition in general. That is like my second biggest passion to agility, uh, those two things, uh, and they go hand in hand. So I'm going to do that every Friday. So I'm going to do a full day of eating at some point. Um, I think I've done one before, but I'm going to do another one because it has changed slightly um, since I last did it, I think. I last did it when I was sponsored by Grenade, I think. Yeah, sad times. Anyway, um, excuse me, my body is just against me today. Um... So what do I eat? So let me run you quickly through an example of what I eat on a day in competition. So I wake up nice and early. I have um, what I call, and I've done a recipe for this before on my Instagram, so go looking for it. Um, it is protein Weetabix cheesecake, in quotation marks. It's not actually a cheesecake, but it's a breakfast. So you get two Weetabix, um, mush them up really th really like finely in a bottom bowl, put some milk in, mush it up. So it's like a, a kind of creamy, thick sort of paste that like, yeah flatten it down in the bottom like a cheesecake base then you get um i get 100 grams of yogurt and put a scoop of protein powder in it mix it up whack that on top smooth it down that's like the cheese part of the cheesecake um and then in the and then you put that in the fridge overnight and then the next morning get up have that and then you i chop a banana and decorate the top with banana then I sprinkle a load of chia seeds on it because chia seeds have loads of health benefits. Then I put a spoon of peanut butter on the top and dig in. And that is my breakfast every single morning of every single competition at the moment. Uh, because I love that I can get up later, I can get more sleep because my breakfast is already in the fridge made. And I can just get up, put the toppings on it and nom away, scran away at that yummy breakfast cheesecake. Um, oh, I'm getting so hungry. I, I need to go and eat after this. Um... So I have that as my breakfast and it's also really filling. It's got lots of protein and fiber. So it keeps me full for longer, especially when I'm eating at like 5 a.m. I normally eat at like 8 a.m. on a normal day, but, you know, it's going to keep me fuller for longer, um, which is important when your day's longer, basically. And then I have a coffee with oat milk um, alongside that. And then mid-morning, I'd have a snack of a an apple. So I, I have green apples. They help with the digestion, stuff like that, you know, the yummy stuff. Then for lunch um, at a competition, I usually have a, a, a full protein bagel. So have anything in it, chicken and avocado and salad or ham and salad and avocado um, at a competition or just a sandwich with like bread. You know, instead of the protein bagel, I might have some other bread, uh, sourdough, I love sourdough um, or oh, I forgot what it's called, like olive bread, like the soft squidgy bread with like olives or tomato, like dried olives or tomatoes in it. Um, and have that with butter, avocado, chicken, salad, ham, any of those things. Um, you know, salad like baby leaf salad, pepper, tomatoes, cucumber, all the things. So a nice fat sandwich or bagel for lunch. And I have that with an energy drink. So um, ideally, I want a energy an energy drink that has BCAAs in it. Um, again, that's a whole different topic nutrition wise, but BCAAs are really good for you. Uh, they give you amino acids, which is found in protein, which helps with muscle. Um, Everything do with your muscles, so muscle, 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 muscle growth, repair, recovery, stuff like that. Uh, but if not, and lately my newest obsession is Zero Sugar Monster. Oh my God, it's so good. The turquoise one, mango, insane. The um, white one, tastes like lemonade, insane. But yeah, my favourite has to be the turquoise Zero Sugar Monster. So I'll have an energy drink there, you know, because I've been up for a long time. So that peaks my energy and it's so refreshing and goes really well with the bagel um i'm getting so into this i love my food um and then as a afternoon mid-afternoon snack i'll have a protein bar and probably another oh no probably not another coffee if i if i've had any drink at lunch but yeah i'll have a protein bar and then obviously when i get home i'll have whatever i have for tea so you know you you want meals that are going to replenish you after a day of competing so you want your carbs fats protein and a bit of veg stuff like that um my teas are never the same and then i'll usually have that with like a 
fat glass of orange juice or if it's like a, Friday, a Saturday night I'll have a cider I'll have a bloody cider or Coke Zero with a shot of toffee vodka in it this is getting really like not nutrition but you know yeah usually the glass of orange juice um and then potentially something for dessert like some chocolate or an ice some ice cream or something like that if it's in the house not always I don't have dessert frequently I have it like maybe once or twice over the weekend so if it's a weekend I might have a dessert and that is it so that is a full day of eating pretty much at a show. Obviously, there might be more. There might Well, there's never going to be less than that. There might be more than that. Like, if someone buys something at a show, like mini donuts, I'm going to have a few. Like, you know, there might be more. <laughs> but that is pretty much the base of... Oh, got an itchy foot. I'm, hang on. Um, that is pretty much the basis of a full day of eating at a show. Obviously, it's so important to fuel yourself throughout the day of a show so that you perform well and not just physically energy wise, but mental energy and alertness. You know, if you're not fueling yourself, you're not going to be able to think about what you're doing. So, but yes, Fitness and Food Friday is coming. Be excited. I'm going to be doing stuff about full days of eating, recipes, um, workouts, all the things like that. So, number 14, what would... This is going to be a long episode. I don't even know how long I've been going, but it feels like 40 minutes. <laughs> anyway, so, 14, what would you do with your life if it wasn't for dogs and agility? The way that's worded really has made me giggle. <laughs> what would I do in my life? I don't know. No, okay. If it wasn't for dogs and agility, if they were out of the picture for whatever reason, if they didn't exist in the world, um... I would do, this is going to come as no shock to you after what I've just been passionately talking about, uh, fitness and nutrition, but I would probably either be a PT, yeah, I'd probably be a PT, so a personal trainer, um, I, obviously, I want to be self-employed, I've always wanted my own business, so I'd probably be a self-employed PT eventually with my own personal training business, um, and I'd probably also do like a nutrition degree or something, I probably wouldn't be, want to be a full dietitian or nutritionist, like, as my full-time job, because, you know, sometimes you have to, like, tell old people what to eat and stuff like that which isn't my passion you know I like the fitness side of it nutrition if that makes sense so I'd probably be a PT fitness instructor with a nutritionist on the side so I can maybe make meal plans for my um, training clients so my PT clients um, I could train them in the gym and then I could also give them a nutrition plan stuff like that um, and maybe even have my own gym eventually. Who knows? But yeah, that is definitely what I'd do in my life if it wasn't for dogs and agility. That would be my thing. I've always said that I would always have a thing. Like, I'm not one to just be... this. Everything I'm saying today sounds so self-absorbed. But I don't think I'd just be, like, just normal. Like, I'm just not a normal person. I'd always have something to obsess over. That's just my personality type, I reckon. Um, so yeah, I would be full send into that if it wasn't for dogs and agility. But, you know, career wise and I mean, I still implement that now. So I go to the, like I said, I work out every day. Um, I eat really well. I enjoy cooking and making food um, and being active. So that is a hobby and passion of mine that I, I mean, I do take the gym a little bit seriously because, you know, the gains, the gains, we've got the gains. Um, but yeah, you know, I try and optimize my fitness and nutrition. But at the end of the day, it's usually, it's just it is more of just a hobby than say dogs and agility is my whole life my whole life what i want to do is a career and stuff like that i know it started out as a hobby but that is the big one in my life but yes if it wasn't for that the big one would be the fitness and nutrition but because the dogs and agility is a thing the fitness and nutrition is second to the dogs and agility so bosh bosh i think i answered that pretty well um <laughs> so 15 i think we're done you can tune out soon don't you worry if you're sick of listening to my voice it's not going to be forever so 15 is how do you stay motivated to work out every day okay so i feel like this is a question that i get quite a bit and a lot of fitnessy type people get this quite a lot i'm going to say it's not even about motivation uh it's about discipline and that sounds so cliche discipline over motivation but it's true I'm not always motivated. Like, I do love the gym. Like, it helps. Let's be honest. It helps. I'm blessed to have a passion for fitness. I love the feeling of working out. I love the pain. I love the burning sensation. It's great. I love the doms the day after. I know I'm a weirdo. Um, so that helps, just enjoying it. Uh, but also knowing how I feel afterwards. There is no feeling like working out, finishing your workout, and having the endorphins flowing, and you just feel great and energised and healthy and fit and strong and huge ma and mazzy. Um... <laughs> But, yeah, so think about the after feeling, um, but mainly, and, and remember your why. Same with anything, same with agility. Why did you start? What's your end goal? You know, set goals. So set yourself a goal of, 
I want to be able to lift this much weight in this much time. So I want to be able to shoulder press this much weight by the end of this month, in this year or whatever. Uh, goals are super. So always set yourself goals. Same with agility. And that will keep you pushing towards something instead of just aimlessly doing things like doing reps for the sake of reps. Um, have something to work towards. So have something to work towards. Remember why you started. Um, and to be honest, even if you don't enjoy it to start with, if you just do it loads consistently, you will probably grow to love it. Um, so my love for it has definitely grown the more I've done it. Um, you know, when I first started, it did feel like a chore and something I had to do. But now I won't go without it. And also make it a habit. So make it like brushing your teeth. So make it part of your routine. Have a routine. Super important in the morning. So I get up, eat my breakfast, get ready for the day, go to the gym, come back, walk out, have lunch, work for the rest of the day. That is kind of my routine, if that makes sense. Um, so I do all that in the morning, then my work in the afternoon. Um, but if it's just part of your routine, it actually feels uncomfortable not to skip it. Like, not uncomfortable not to do it or to skip it. It feels wrong. It's like, I've missed something in my routine. This, this is bogging me. I mean, I have a pretty OCD personality, so that probably helps in that way, I guess. That's helpful in that sense. Um, but yeah, that is definitely something. Make it like having a shower, brushing your teeth and non-negotiable. Um, and then, but yeah, discipline. Just just make yourself do it to start with. Uh, trust me here, make yourself do it for the bigger picture that you need to clarify with yourself in your head before you do it. And then after doing that for a while, it'll become habit, it'll become routine and you will want to do it. So the want and the motivation comes after the discipline, the initial discipline, if that makes sense. Um, and just think how much it'll improve your agility performance, because I'm telling you now it has mine, <laughs> um, especially for running a fast dog like Arrow. So 16, is online dog training your dream career? Great question. So I've always wanted to be a dog trainer. Um, and since I've been doing agility, I've always wanted to be an agility trainer. Hence, Lucy Norton, me, my hero, like num question number of like three or whatever it was at the start of the episode. So I've always wanted to do that. However, more recently, um, I've had a bit of a change of heart. So obviously I don't have a field or a full set of equipment to train in person. So I've been doing the online dog training and um, I do love working from home. I enjoy creating content. Um, I enjoy making things like um, trading plans, stuff like that. Uh, so it's all like computer work, which I enjoy doing from home. So work from home, love it, perfect. Always wanted my own business as well. So I'm like, I feel like I'm creating a brand for myself um, and I love being my own boss. I do not want to work for someone forever. I don't, I just don't, my voice just broke. Um, so like the PT thing, I, I, will always, I will always want to work for myself, no matter what that is. Um, so I'd say the agility training in person started out as my dream career. But obviously, the best thing I can do at the moment is the online training because I don't have the space or equipment to do in-person training. And I'm really enjoying the online training and it's kicked off more than I thought it, it would, to be honest. Like, I'm really, I'm, I'm pleased with it. Um, I don't think it's going to be my, obviously, I'm still working part-time in uh, fast food as well. Um, I don't think the online dog training will be my permanent full-time big earner throughout life. But it's something on the side to do. Um and I've recently, and that I enjoy, obviously, and that is really fulfilling because I help people and their dogs. Um, and obviously, I know the most about agility training. Like, that is my niche that I know the most about. So all I can do is share that knowledge, um, and I enjoy doing so. So if I can make it into a little business, perfect, um, which I'm doing at the moment. But I've had a slight change of heart, and I'm actually starting a dog grooming course in June, which is super exciting. And my new dream career is to have my own dog grooming business, with my own van, uh, mobile dog grooming and that is what I'm going to be working towards so ideally I'd like to do that as my full-time job eventually in my own business but then also do a little bit of the online dog training on the side um, or if I get a field or land one day or marry a rich guy who has loads of land and uses field and no, I'm joking <laughs> or am I am I joking <laughs> only you can decide <laughs> anyway um, if I ever do end up with space uh, I could do a little bit of in-person agility training uh, you know part-time here and there on the side but yeah that is my career goals um, full-time mobile dog room with my own business and then either in-person or online dog training on the side so that is the plan of action um, 17 that's just got me so excited right so 17 how do you oh sorry how did you find the confidence to start a podcast Great question. Um, 
Okay, so first of all, to make yourself feel better, if you want to start a podcast and you don't have the confidence, go back right now on YouTube ideally, because it's hilarious, to my very first podcast ep no, is it the trailer? I think it's the trailer. Go back to the trailer or the very first, the quality's horrendous because I use my really old DSLR. And I'm pretty sure it's with the rosettes in the background. I'm in like a really not that attractive fluffy hoodie. Um, anyway, watch that because I'm so awkward. I don't know how to act. Don't know how to look, don't know what to do. And now I'm so relaxed. I could, I could talk to the camera for, for hours. And I think I'm on episode, this is 25, I think. So it hasn't even taken that long, one episode a week. And I'm 110 million percent confident now. So again... I didn't find the confidence to start a podcast. I just did it, even though I wasn't confident to do it. Hence, the first few videos are awful. I look like a social, socially anxious wreck. But I had to get those out the way with to become more confident. So again, it's a bit like the how do you get the motivation to work out? You don't. You do the discipline and that leads to motivation. So for the podcast, you do the awkward, uncomfortable, unco like you do the podcast episodes when you're not confident and you haven't found the confidence. And then doing that, through doing that, you find the confidence. So just do it. Just do it. That is my advice. How did you find the confidence? Start a podcast. Do it. Do a few episodes and then you will find it eventually, but you're not going to find it before you do your first episode, if that makes sense. So don't be afraid. And if you want to come on my podcast and talk about something to get your confidence up do it like if you want to be a guest on this podcast and even if you don't know what to talk about just let me know and I'll have you on and we can do a podcast and then it's not just going to be you talking it's going to be mostly me talking so it's like a nice way in I suppose but yeah just shoot me a dm if you want to be on the podcast as some practice but yeah don't be afraid just do it so number 18 oh i think this is the last question this is the last question this episode is going to be like nearly an hour but you love it so number 18 this is a really random question do you have a large friend group no 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 i don't um so i've done a few episodes about having a social life outside of agility before um I'd say my social life is decent. Uh, it's not huge. Um, but no, I don't have a group of friends. I did throughout school, but then that broke up. That didn't, wasn't sustainable. And then when I started my job, I did have a group of friends. But again, that just broke up because people went to uni. Relationships in the group broke up, stuff like that. Things change, people move on, blah, blah, blah. It is what it is. Um, so I've had a lot of friends through life, but no, at the moment, no, I don't have one big friend group, but I'm learning, I think I'm learning that it's actually better that way. Like I said, I'd say in, I, I don't know if I'm meant to say what city I live in on a podcast. Is that a good idea? I nearly said it. I'm not going to say it just in case you don't know what weirdos are out there. I don't know if people, most of you probably know anyway, but anyway, in the city I live in, um, I don't have a big friend group. I'd probably have about five or six good friends. Like, five or six really good friends that I don't see frequently. Maybe, like, one of them I see maybe, like, three times a year. But, like, I'd say she's my best friend that I've known for the longest. Um, and then another one I probably see every month or so. Uh, yeah, probably one I see, like, a few times a year because we're both really busy. The other, maybe four or five, I'd probably say I see, like, once a month or every two months. So, spread across five people i actually do seem to go out a lot with people but it's usually one-on-one -on -one stuff not like a big friend group if that makes sense like i usually go out with people just me and them if that makes sense like a little cute friend date every now and again um I might just get them all together one day and be like this is a friend group now no um i don't mind um i do like those one-on-one -on -one interactions you can have like i don't know um Often the conversations are like deeper and better and stuff like that. But anyway, no, I don't have a large friend group. Um, and then obviously in agility, I would say I've got a friend group in agility. Um, but again, people in my, my all my friends in agility, it's probably like, there's loads. See, I've got loads of friends in agility. And that's not being like, oh, I'm so popular. It's saying I don't really have a specific group. I like spread myself out around people. Um, but in agility, I probably have like five really good friends, but they all live forever away. So I barely see them. I'll maybe see them like once a year at show and then maybe twice a year if we meet up and do a road trip to meet up like another point in the year that's separate to the shows. So once or twice a year, maybe three times, maybe if they come to more shows. But yeah, I live nowhere near anyone from agility. Um, so I'd say I do have a lot of friends, but I don't have a large friend group. Um because everyone's scattered everywhere. So yeah, um, 
yeah that's it um yeah nothing else to say on that question really and that's it that is all the questions this has been a super long episode but i'm here for it i've really enjoyed filming this recording this uh, episode oh look i've been i've been speaking for so long my brain is frazzling i need to go eat food i'm gonna have some protein yogurt and chill but yeah i really hope you enjoyed that blind q a that was fun i might do another one tell me if you want another one that'd be cool but without further ado and before i bore you even more than i already have done check out all my social media um and i'll put the links here on the screen on youtube and down below in the description on excuse me again apple and spotify go follow all of those i'm acting pretty much every day on them all um maybe not youtube or tiktok but there are lots of videos on there and i'm getting more regular at them um they're all active basically instagram is literally every day stories posts everything um so go follow all of those so you never miss another episode uh follow the podcast obviously and subscribe on youtube so you don't miss another podcast episode every wednesday at 8 p.m guys uh, 25 episodes of consistent wednesday night at 8 p.m episodes i'm so proud of myself i'm really into it now like i can't i can't go a week without doing an episode um but hopefully we've got Ant Clark on the podcast next week or the week after, depending on when we get to record. But that's going to be a really fun episode. So make sure you don't miss that. You don't want to miss that one. That'll be a good one. Um, and yeah, if you can, please leave a rating or a view. Nice and kind if you if you don't mind. If it's one star, maybe maybe leave it to yourself. Um, keep it to yourself. No. Um, yeah, rating or review on Apple or Spotify would mean the absolute world to me. And I love you all. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you next Wednesday. Next Wednesday's episode, like I said, should be a cool guest episode. Bye, guys.